Welcome to Equal Inspired, the inclusive podcast, brought to you by Equal IT. Stacey Cashmore joins us, who is a tech explorer DevOps at Omniplan in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Stacey's been working in the IT space since the middle of the 1990s, and over the most recent years has been honoured to call herself a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies. Since 2019, Stacey's been presenting, speaking at many different conferences and meetups and really using her love for learning to look into new ways of working and new technologies. When Stacey's not working or creating tasks, she loves to build Lego with her family. And something that Stacey is incredibly passionate about is raising awareness on mental health issues and also breaking down the stigma of talking about them. And these are some topics we will be diving deeply into on today's discussion. Hi, thanks for having me here. And uh, yeah, thanks for the great introduction. We would love to know who or what inspired you to pursue a career in tech. There's a couple of people from when I was growing up. Um, on the one side, you've got in the movies, I grew up in the 80s. So you had uh, War Games, which uh, with Matthew Broderick, if I pronounce his name right, amazing film. And I want to say really cool things with computers. But if you think about it, it's not really. But really impressive things with computers. Um. And then on a personal level, uh, I grew up without a computer. I didn't own my own computer until I was in my teens, I think. My brother had one, but I never had one. But a friend of my parents was really into IT. And whenever we went around their house for food, I got to play on uh, his Atari ST, playing games, doing various things on it. And it, it was always interesting. And following that through... Um, when my brother got a computer, when he wasn't on it, he would play games and I would try and program it. And it, 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 it wasn't the best computer for programming. I wasn't the right person for programming at the time. I didn't really know enough or have the, uh, the, the knowledge to really do anything cool. So I was just playing with it, trying different things and ended up just doing art as code. So it, it, it was on a little Atari and you could use basic to draw shapes and patterns on the screen. And it was all, if I do this, what happens? And it's like, okay, so if that put a square there, how do I get a square somewhere else? And trying different things to get it to work. And I think up until my teenage years, that is really what got me in. So if it wasn't for the, that friend of my parents, I'd have been a teenager before I really started playing with computers. I don't know if it would have clicked with me as much as it did doing it when I was much younger. Looking at yourself now, how would you define or describe your technical focus? These days, uh, my, my technical focus now is playing. I, I've had so many people who complain at me using the word playing with computers. But my focus right now is trying new things to see what new technologies are out there, how we can use them. Um, how we can improve the way that we work and how we can improve the way that our applications run. And, and it's really just that um, exploration. It, it's part of why I wanted in my job title Tech Explorer, because I get to look around and try new things and see what's out there. And sometimes it is uh, imposter syndrome inducing. If you're looking at something, you can't get it working. It's it's horrible that that really drops your confidence level down um sometimes you look at it and you think oh there's no way i can ever get that working and it's really hard to even start but i sent out a tweet last week i was doing something can't remember exactly what right now but i was doing something and i got it working and it was such a stupid simple little thing for someone with 25 years of experience it was an absolute nothing but i got it working and it really gave me that that ting of trying something new again uh so i actually tweeted that you know, after 25 years i still have the excitement at when you get something working no matter how small it is try something new and when it works it, it just lights you up what kind of tech are you excited about at the moment then on your journey or your new adventure i have a huge focus on uh, azure static web apps so i i'm trying to learn a uh, blazer so it's, I, I'm currently, if I'm allowed to say this, I'm currently writing a book on Azure static web apps, creating them with uh, a Blazor application and .NET 
function backends. And th there's a lot that I know from what I've done over the last two years. I've written quite a few uh, talks about static web apps. But now I'm having to do the real deep dives, the, the things that I've skimmed over in the past. I'm now having to dive deeply into it to make sure that what I think is my understanding is the actual understanding that I need to be able to write it down on paper. And I am learning so much that I didn't even realize was there. So I, I'm just trying to deep dive into all of the different facets around the Azure static web apps to see what I can do with it. That's really interesting because I think sometimes it can be quite a daunting thing going into new ter territory, new technologies. Where do you begin, right? So just on that topic, what kind of advice would you share to somebody when it comes to trying something new? How can they get started? Maybe some things that really help you with the learning process. The main thing that I would say if you're trying something new is um, Google is your friend. Uh, try, try and find the simplest tutorial that you can get hold of. And once you've worked through the simplest tutorial, break it. Figure out, try something different. Try different um, ideas. So, okay, if I change this line of code, what's going to happen? And if you can correctly guess what's going to happen, you know you're going in the right direction. And if you do something that breaks totally, You've got new things to Google because you'll have your error messages uh, and you'll be learning a lot more at that time too. You'll see a lot more possibilities when you break things than when it always works. Um, and on top of that, if you are doing this, blog about it afterwards too because there are going to be so many more people coming in your position. Even if you think there are thousands of people who have blogged this, what's the point? Everybody has their own insights and everybody works slightly differently. So if you try this, if you've got into it, you've managed to make it work, you've managed to break it, do a, a, a quick blog post. I, I tried this and this is what happened. So that the next person coming along has one more resource that they can look at. And who knows, maybe your experiences are what is going to trigger them more than the blog posts that are already out there. Really, really important advice. Obviously, continuous learning, experimentation, these are things that you're really into. What else do you enjoy the most about working in tech? It's two-sided. The thing I enjoy and the thing I hate most is the same thing, and that's just how fast everything goes right now. It's that there's always something new to learn. There's always something new and exciting coming up. There's always something that can grab your attention and pull you in a new direction. And... Seeing that come past, it's great for the dopamine side because there's always something grabbing you, pulling you along. But it also means you have to make choices. What, 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 what part of it are you going to chase after? Uh, and what part of it are you going to get the knowledge uh, and the depth and breadth of knowledge about? Uh, but the thing that I love is just that it's so fast and there is so much out there. There's something in tech for, I would say, nearly everybody. There's something that can grab you, whether or not you're not a coder and you want a low-code solution, um, power apps, logic apps, so that you can make it do something useful to you, or whether or not you are an absolute code-driven person and you've got Go, you've got Angular, React, uh, Node, C-sharp, F-sharp, there are so many different languages and frameworks and ways to build and ways to host that there's something for everybody out there and there's something to fit every solution that you want to build. And I, I just love that you've got that breadth of choice available to you in order to start. You touched on something there about it always changing. It always is evolving, which is great on one hand, but we're going to obviously talk a little bit about anxieties and mental health and how that can impact. And one thing I feel is sometimes when everything is moving so fast, it can become quite overwhelming to the point where you have so much going on in your mind and you're putting so much pressure on yourself. I need to do this. I need to learn this. I, I need to keep up to scratch. How do you think you can ground yourself sometimes if you get those thoughts and feelings because it is evolving so quickly? For me, in those situations, it happens way more often than I would like it to still. I, um, sometimes it, the main thing that I really need is just to turn off. 
So take a step away and try not to think about tech for a day or two. Work your way through. Do something else. Build Lego. Just take your mind off of what you're doing. And the other one is really making that choice about where you're going to go. I think it comes back to the static web apps that I was speaking about earlier. That is the first time in a few years that I really managed to get a handle on being completely overwhelmed by everything. Um, I, I went through a stage of there's just so much and I need to know it all. If I don't know it all, why am I even in IT? I've got to know it all. And I said becoming an, MP, uh, an MVP for Microsoft actually made that worse because then you really you're drinking from the water hose. And you really see just what's out there, and it's even more than I thought. And it, it is, as you say, totally overwhelming. It's really hard to figure out what you want to do. But it, eventually, it was just finding that one thing that totally clicked and gives you a complete, that's cool moment. And for me, that was static web apps. It's... um. It, 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 it's something that speaks to me about making tech accessible to as many people as possible. And because that clicked with me, it was very fact, right? I've been putting off building my own website for too long. Let's build one using this and just doing it step by step and just building up feature by feature what's available. And yeah, it, it's that click of doing something that can open up new worlds to new people, that is the one that spoke to me. It might be that you're a completely uh, data-driven person and you see the awesome things that are coming out with Cosmos DB, with Azure SQL that really triggers you on the solutions that you can see happening with them. And when you get that moment, run with it. Don't let that moment escape you. you. You've got so many other things that you'll think, that's cool, I'd like to do that. But when you get the, the, the total, oh, that's awesome, it's, I, I need to do this, do it. Dive in, figure out what you need to do with it, run with it and see what amazing things you can build. I'm so pleased that you found your focus point as well and now you're writing a book. That's absolutely incredible. My mind is still blown from that. I, I st I'm halfway through writing the book and I still don't believe it. When are you hoping to finish or release? I hope to get it finished by the end of June. Um, and it should be released, I believe, in September. Growing up, as well, being in the UK, I know you've relocated now to Amsterdam, but you mentioned that you didn't personally have a computer. How do you feel that the UK class structures impacted your choices when you were growing up and your education? Growing up, it was quite difficult um, school-wise. Uh, I, I think I, I had a great conversation with somebody the other day about having computers in school, and they're talking about, yes, when we were at school, you know, so we, we didn't have Chromebooks for everybody. We had like uh, just a couple to go around the class that we used. So when I was in school, we had computer labs and that was it. Uh, but, but when I was in um, primary school, juniors as we called it back then, there was literally like you know, one computer for the school and everybody took it in turns to go in it. So I could do some things, but not much. When it got to secondary school, the biggest issue that we had there, uh, I really hope it's changed these days, is the teachers at that school, many of the teachers at that school, not all of them, really um, took on the view of making sure that you don't, don't do anything to disappoint yourself. And I, I literally had two or three teachers tell me that I was setting myself up for disappointment by wanting to program computers, by wanting to go out and do um, interesting stuff. Uh, one teacher actually used that, uh, that awful phrase, remember your station. Remember your station, you're just going to disappoint yourself. Don't aim so high. And if I think back and look back at what went on in school, it's... Um, it was a strange school in the way that we had two really poor areas in the school and we had two really posh areas in the same catchment area. 
and you could totally see the difference with the teachers. So if you came from the council estate, then you were absolutely saying, yeah, remember what you're doing. Uh, yes. Why don't you think about a shop or a factory? And the people who had parents that were higher educated, they had parents that were um, in higher um, positions in employment, they got a lot more um, guidance on further education and doing what they needed to do. And I think I, I, I just fought it. it. It brought out the rebel in me and it was, no, I, I'm going to do this. I, I'm going to fight. I'm going to do this. It's, thankfully, my parents were awesome. My parents weren't apathetic at all. And I remember my, I think it was my mum said to one of my teachers at one time, doesn't matter how high they aim. Doesn't matter if they hit how high they aim. If they're aiming high and they hit halfway up, it's better than aiming for the bottom. And it's... They, they supported me when growing up by um, not forcing me to do schoolwork, but they did constantly tell me, if you want to do this, you need to put the effort in. We will support you in what you do, but you've got to put the effort in. If you don't want to put the effort in, that's fine. That is your choice. But if you want to do this, then you've got to do it properly. And they helped me get through, um, let's say, school and college. Uh, they supported me through university by letting me stay at home. So I didn't go away to university because I really couldn't have afforded that. Um... But yeah, it, it was it, it was such a, a juxtaposition from teachers that I would hope these days teachers are way more supportive and way more telling people to aim for whatever they want to go at. And yeah, not teachers that are saying, eh. Um, it's, I think it's an interesting one was the Ofsted report that I read uh, not long after I moved to the Netherlands about my school. Um, I was Googling and I came across it and I was curious. And there was such a demeaning line in that Ofsted report. Um, the exam results of this school are not amazing, but considering the catchment area, it's as good as can be expected. And it was like, how are you supposed to inspire people with that type of language? It's, um, I think all through school, there was one teacher, the computer teacher, of course, uh, I, that really went out of his way to help me. Um, he, he saw how interested I was, and he offered me, um, I guess, private tuition. It's, uh, I, I could go in after school. He would teach me um, programming. I, I would make the computer do cool stuff. I didn't really have the understanding of what I was doing at the time, but I could make the computer do cool stuff. And it was, it was enough to keep me going and keep me interested and get me onto college where I did learn to understand what I was doing. But it, it's, uh, he really helped me forward. And he's one of the few teachers whose name I remember, Mr. Cox. He was, uh, he, he, he was, he took an interest. I, I, and he didn't write people off. He took an interest and tried to push people forward. It's crazy to hear the things that were said to you. Um, it really is. And similar to yourself, I hope things are different now and there's so much more support. What advice could you share to someone who hears these comments? How can they not let it define them? I think they're not letting it define them. That's a tough one. Um, I... I, I have enough mental health issues from the you know the, the thousand paper cuts growing up. Uh, the, the one thing that I would say though is fight it. It's be the rebel, be the annoying person who's not listening to that person in authority, and and fight. It, it's I, I think in those situations, it, you, one of two things is going to happen. It, either it's going to completely demoralize you and knock you off your feet and uh, destroy you. Or it's going to really, really make you angry and try and channel that into the anger and then channel that anger 
into um, the, the effort and the work that you need in order to make it happen. And really, I, I so would have loved to have gone back to a few of my teachers um, over the last few years with where I am in my career now and really I, that, that pretty woman moment where she's shopping on the, the main street and you're, you're on commission, big mistake. And I would just love to go back to the teachers and go, remember you, were the, you know, when you said I wasn't going to be anything? It's, uh, yeah, it's, I might not be running a company. I might not be, I don't know, whatever. But I'm doing what I love and I enjoy what I'm doing and I'm making a living doing it. And this is all stuff that you said I couldn't do. So it's take those words. Try not to... Try not to fester on the frustration and the annoyance of it. Take that energy and do something really positive with it. I, I think that's the best thing that I can say. And it is so hard to do. And I don't know where I would be without the support that I had of my parents. But ju just do your best to, to channel that frustration and anger and disappointment and put it into something which is going to be awesome. I love that advice, Stacey. It's so, so valuable. You mentioned mental health as well. And I know it's something you're really passionate about, just raising awareness and breaking down that stigma and talking about it. I'll be quite honest. It's a topic really close to my heart. It's had a, a profound impact actually on, on my family um, growing up. Could you share a little bit about your journey? It's coincidental. I've just had my last therapy session. I, I have one more session for evaluation and then I'm done next week uh, or next month. But I I have been in therapy for four, four years, maybe a bit longer now. And with everything that I went through growing up, like I was also the weird one. Um, I got bullied uh, an amount growing up, um, an amount mental. Sometimes physical, but mainly more mental than anything else. Um, it, it put me really inside of myself growing up. I, I don't do, it sounds odd coming from somebody who speaks on a stage, but I don't do groups of people. I, I really, I struggle with groups of people and I think I always will do. But about four years ago, I I hit the point where I knew I had to do something. There were... There was a few different things that really hit. One was when I was out of the house, when I was in the office, I realized that I wasn't working anymore. And, and seriously, how I never got wrote up or anything else, I don't know. But I suddenly realized that I was spending 80% of my time not staring at my screens, but staring past them. And it got to the point where I was just spending most of my days just desperately trying not to cry, trying to trying to battle the thought that the only thing that I could do is get underneath the desk and hide from the world. Um, and that went on for an amount of time. I, I got to the point where going for lunch with my colleagues it, it if i went with them it was okay but if they went five minutes before me then i would try and sneak down to the canteen get some food and sneak back and eat at my desk and think of some excuse of why i'm eating at my desk instead of in the canteen um and, and yeah to just hide from hide from the world and, and and that was outside at home I think that was the hardest part I, I I had a young son at the time and on my days off when I'm supposed to be playing with him I I had it far too often that I would be on the sofa I would see him playing and in my head, 
I know I'm supposed to be playing with him. I know he wants me to play with him. I want to play with him. And I couldn't. That there is nothing that could... It, it's... I don't know how to... Dis it, it, it is the worst feeling I've ever had. It was just... The thoughts to move just didn't connect. And... At the time, I didn't feel... I didn't feel sad or anything else. There was just nothing. A and... I will always regret that time when I wasn't doing the stuff with him that you're supposed to do. Uh, it's You tried to make up for it, you tried to do different things, um, but, but when that really got bad, the things in the office, that at home, I don't know, something clicked and I knew I had to get help. Um, I... I ended up going to the doctor and I'm pleased to say that my GP here in the Netherlands is awesome. Um, I sat down. I told him I needed help, but I couldn't really describe what the problem was. And he, he instantly gave me the referral for a therapist. And... I think it's, I said something like, oh, thank you, and it's, I, I was so scared of coming here. And I said, what were you afraid of? That I was going to say, like, no to you for a referral. And it's like, yeah. It, 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 the, the, the big fear in, in my head, it's, it, it's always so odd to say, it's about mental health, but you're always afraid that the person is going to say to you, there's nothing wrong with you, it's just in your head. And you know what? It is just in my head that is the problem. Um, but the fact that he he listened and he believed and he... Not only did he give me the referral, he actually listened to the complaints that I had and he recommended a particular therapist based on the complaints I had. Um... And yeah, from there, it, it it was getting into therapy was the best thing that happened to me. It, it was um, it was extremely hard. It destroyed me from time to time. Uh, thankfully, in the Netherlands, we have excellent employment laws, and I've had excellent employers. Um, so when I've been to therapy, I, I've come out of therapy sometimes, and I've not been able to. I've not been able to speak. I've not been able to think. It's been going over things with a therapist, which totally triggered me. And being able to speak to your manager and say, look, I can't work today. It, it, this has completely killed me. It's taken me 20 minutes to start the car to drive home. Uh, and having somebody help you through that and let you know that you don't need to stress. It's like, go home, you're on the sick, look after yourself. We need you in a good condition. We, we, there's no point in pushing you to do something now that's gonna break you more. We need you in a good condition. And I've been, I've been supremely lucky in, in having that in my, uh, in my last two jobs. Um, but it, 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 it does slowly get better. Um, working with a therapist, it, it doesn't, I'm not cured. It, it doesn't solve your mental health issues, I don't think, if I look at myself. I, I, what it does do is give you the ability to recognize your mental health issues. So I can see when I'm dropping into a depressive mood. And when that happens... I know that I've got to do one of two things. If, if I'm not too far gone, then I know I need to do something to give me a boost. And that, that can be something as simple as um, clean the kitchen. I, I, I just need to do something to just give me that, that snap of dopamine and get me back. Um, or I know that I just need to go and lie down. And, and the same goes with the anxiety. I, I now have for the anxiety side of my mental health. Um, my headphones. 
I I have started taking my headphones more places with me because I know that when I'm getting triggered from people and when my anxiety is starting to build up, noise cancelling headphones are awesome because even though you're in a group of people, if you can put headphones on, you can disappear. The noise is gone. I, um, it is really embarrassing to do. It's really confrontational to do, especially if it is a group of friends or family. Uh, I had it in a running group recently. Uh, I turned up on the morning. I had headphones around my neck and someone made the joke, oh, you're going to be listening to music when you're in this morning. It's like, nope, I've had an awful mental health week. And if I need to disappear, these are going on. It's nothing against you. But if I need to disappear, I need to disappear. And learning these um, these coping mechanisms, that is really what has made the difference. It, it, it's what I was discussing with my therapist today in the last session. It's like, you know, do you need to continue? And it's like, it's scary to say no, but no, I don't think I do. I, I have the coping mechanisms. I have the tools. I know I'm still going to have episodes that are bad, but I have the tools to cope with it. And I don't think more sessions is going to improve that. So I, I've, I've got to the point where I think I can stand on my own two feet. And it, 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 it's a horrendous journey to go through. Um, I've had several different types of therapy, um, depending on what I was doing with the therapist at the time. Some of them, like I say, they, they have totally knocked me out and knocked me off my feet, sometimes for days. Um, but the end result is a good thing. But it, it's a conversation which I really don't think we have enough. I agree completely. I think that actually it can be quite taboo, viewed as quite a taboo topic. People don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to upset someone. But actually sometimes just on the topic of mental health, being very black and white and just being very honest yeah. about how we're feeling is actually going to be so much more beneficial yeah. to people instead of masking, instead of trying to cover up our feelings and just facing it head on. And again, it kind of ties into that fear of judgments, right? I speak to so many people who they feel embarrassed, maybe. They're, they're too scared to seek for help because they feel weak because of what people might say. Oh, I don't need therapy in denial, right? And what you did took great courage to reflect and realize that you needed that help. So what advice can you share to anyone who is in that headspace where they feel that it's weakness, it's it's embarrassing. How can we break down that stigma? First of all, and you're never going to believe it, but I'm going to say it anyway, it is absolutely not a weakness. If someone was to say it to me, I wouldn't believe them, but I can say it to somebody else and I do wholeheartedly believe it. it it's a very odd thing to experience. Um, but it, it's absolutely not a weakness. You are absolutely not alone. That, that I think, number one, you are absolutely not alone. If you've got people who are trying to help you, but are making it worse, tell them. I, I, I think for me, if I could go back four years, that would be one of the main things that I'd like to tell myself. It's, there are people who, they think they're trying to help. And it's, uh, it's just smile. Everybody feels like that sometimes. Um, and it's like, we, we all have bad days. And people say that thinking that they're going to cheer you up and they're going to pull you out. And it comes from such a positive place. But it... Content warning. It quite literally makes you want to throw yourself off of the roof and, and, and literally makes that become a thought in your head. And I think I got upset. I think I actually got upset more with people who thought they were helping and weren't than people who didn't help if you know what I mean it, it it's 
It's, it's somebody's trying to help and they're, they're saying that kind of thing. It really drags you down. And that's why I think it, if I could go back, if someone's doing that to you, you've got to let them know. And the one thing that I did learn eventually took too long. There were people that I stopped talking to about it. Um, which is, again, it's a form of masking. It's like, how are you? I'm fine. I, I'm not. I'm completely dead inside. But I'm fine because I don't want this conversation again. Because that conversation is not helping me. Um, I say, it feels bad to say because some of the people who said it, they're very good friends. They were really trying to help. They were doing what they thought was the right thing, but it's absolutely not. Um, so when you get those people, try... You don't cut them out of your life if you don't need to. Um, but but don't don't listen to the whole thing of everybody feels like this. If you're in that space, then you know that it's not what everybody feels. Um, I, I read a wonderful one on a support group. People without mental health issues don't think they have mental health issues. If you're in a place where you think you have a mental health issue, then you have one. And take it seriously for yourself. Don't listen to people who are telling you you don't. And if you can get the courage and the energy to get help before you reach the stage that I did, please do. But it's... Uh, it, it's I know that that wouldn't have helped me in that situation and I wish I could say something that would actually help people. But I, I'm putting myself back in my own shoes four years ago trying to think, what would have helped me? And I, I'm afraid to say that I, I really can't. I, aside from my partner forcing me to go to the doctors, when I said, I'm feeling like this, and she said, go to the doctors. And it still took two weeks after that conversation to actually call the doctors and make the appointment. But having somebody push you down that path, that is what started my road to recovery. Um... And outside of that, the only thing I can say is please have strength and please, you, know, you are not weak. You are not imagining it. Um, like I say, that, that quote, it, it was beautiful. It's People without mental health issues don't believe that they have mental health issues. And it even goes to the point of if you don't have the mental health issue you think you have, if you think you've got a mental health issue, then there is something there that you need to talk to somebody about. It is real. It is valid and you deserve help. You mentioned a few things there like toxic positivity. I think that's a big one, right? Where people yeah. genuinely think that they are helping. They're saying the right things when actually it's doing a lot more harm than good. How do you feel we can better support individuals? Let's say your colleague, for example, who you do know is suffering with mental health. I think the most important thing you can do is ask them. And, it, and that's not a one time thing. Sometimes that person is going to need you to be nothing more than a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes they are going to need you to think with them and talk with them and help them work things through. Sometimes they are just going to literally need you to be in the same space, but not saying anything. And... The, the best way that you can help someone in this position is to ask them, listen to what they say. And if they're in the position where they say, I don't know what I need from you, unless they explicitly say they want to be alone, just be there. We say, okay, we, we don't have to talk. We don't have to do anything. I'm here for you. Do you want me to stay and just be quiet? And just be just be in that space for them so that you can do stuff when they when they need it. And if you if you know the person well enough, if they are comfortable with it, then be at the end of a phone, a WhatsApp. Um I have a very good friend that 
I met from speaking. And if I'm in a bad place and I just need to disappear, then I know that I can drop her a WhatsApp. And it can just be as simple as I am having the worst day. And it is having somebody at the other end who isn't your partner, because obviously your partner is super important here. But it's also important to have somebody outside that understands, listens, and can be there for you. Even if they're hundreds of miles away, having somebody that can be there for you is um, it is super important. I think it boils down again to that having that courage to just speak about it, to open up to at least somebody. Because when you hold everything in, you, you keep everything into yourself and in your mind, you just feel such a heavy weight, right? And And actually, sometimes by being open, by releasing it to somebody, it can... You can feel like you can almost breathe a little bit. Yeah. It it, it can ground you again. It, it's, if you've got somebody that is able and prepared to listen and to understand, then it can, it, it can really ground you. And it can also, it's like, hey, somebody else sees this. It's not just me. Somebody else sees this. And it can... Yeah, it, it, it can bring you back. How can you overcome that feeling of at times almost worrying that you're being a burden? Because I myself, I've been in the position where things have been really shitty, right? And I know my friends, my family are going through a really difficult time. And I feel like I don't want to be that burden. I don't want to put my problems on everyone else when they're all going through it. I think it depends on the people and when you can let the other person know that they can reciprocate. So uh, the, the same as I've just said for my friend in Sweden, when she's going through the same thing, I will get a message from her as well. I, and we're there to support each other. And it, it's interesting what you say about being a burden, because both of us, if you went through our WhatsApp history, there's probably 10, 20 times that both of us have said to the other one, I am so sorry for being such a pain. And... The answer is always the same. It's like, you know, you're my friend. You're not a pain. I'm here for you. And it, it can be hard when you know when both people are going through something heavy. It, it can be really difficult because it doesn't matter how bad you are. You always assume that you're not as bad as the other person. Um, and I, I think it's if you have the open communication with that person, then you're going to be saying, I'm sorry for being a burden, and they're going to be saying, it's fine, and you're going to do this repeatedly and back and forth to each other. And if it's somebody that really doesn't have that energy and can't help you, then you're going to get this from your conversations. And being entirely selfish it isn't about not being a burden on the other person if you're in the place where you desperately need that help and they're not in the place where they can give that help it is absolutely no judgment on the other person but you need to find somebody who can and it's so it, it, it's not so much a how can i know i'm not being a burden on this person that has all of these problems I think you will know from the communication with each other whether or not you are in that type of relationship. And if you are, you are not going to be the burden onto that person. And if that person can't reciprocate, that's fair enough. They can be in a place where they really can't reciprocate. It, it's, it's not fine, but it's fine, if you know what I mean. It's, um, it, it is completely understandable and acceptable. And it means that you need to find somebody else who can help you. That's going to be hard. But you need to do that. Uh, and, and, and not because you don't want to be the burden on the other person, but because you need the support that they don't have the ability to provide to you right now. And you, you deserve that support, the same as the other person deserves the support that they need. I actually think overthinking can be our worst enemy. We build up every different scenario in our mind. But when we actually do the thing, it's certainly not half as bad as we make it out to be. 
And I think that's the same thing with approaching people when we need support, when we need help. We build up this huge scenario in our mind that we're going to get told to go away, get shut down. And you really have nothing to lose in by just opening up, putting yourself out there. And like you say, if somebody can't support you in that moment in time, as long as they're polite about it, just be understanding of that, right? And yeah. don't just leave it there and think, well, I'm, I'm not going to open up to anyone. Find somebody else because there will be someone. You certainly are not alone. No, you're certainly not alone. And I think if you are in that position where you don't have that energy to give back to somebody, I think what you said there is it, 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 it's absolutely what it needs to be. Be polite. Let them know. Don't tell them they're a burden. Please, please don't tell them they're a burden. But just tell them that you're not in a place that can do this right now. You do care, but they need more than you can give so that they can get the help from where they need. So important. What more can we do, do you think, to break down the stigma around mental health? I think number one is, I hope, I, I really hope, one of the reasons why I talk about it and why I'm completely open about having a therapist, about having mental health issues is because I really want people to be able to talk about it. Uh, so it's, I, I've had a question before from somebody. It's like, you walk into a room and say that you're like, you've got to leave because you've got a therapy appointment. Do, do you really want the office to know that you've got a therapy appointment? It's like, yeah, it's, it, it isn't something that anybody should be afraid of. And there's a good chance that there's somebody else in that office that is going through something and knowing, seeing somebody say, yeah, I've got a therapy appointment, I've got to go, um, can let them know that this isn't something to be ashamed of. Um, I have a young child and I talk about my mental health with him. And he's awesome. I, I, I had a really bad episode once. And he brought something upstairs because he thought I was physically ill. So he brought something up to look after me. And I had to explain that now sometimes you, you don't feel well here. And sometimes you don't feel well here. And it's fine. It will get better. But it can happen. And I, I really don't want him to grow up with the mindset of you have to be the strong person. You, you have to be always okay and never having any crises and it's like it's no it's it, if you have an issue you have an issue and what you do with it is the most important thing and talk about it with people and be open and don't act like it's some family shameful secret which is how I when I was growing up that is how it was treated you heard from other people it's like I oh, yeah They've got a brother and, you know, he was in the mental hospital. And it's not a shameful secret. It's that person had an issue and they're dealing with their issue. And I, I can see with people that I know people who used to talk like that. And I see them today and they talk differently today. And that is awesome to see. But there's generations that grew up with that. And we need to make sure that the new generations don't grow up with that. Um. So it's if... If you are going through it and you are strong enough to be open about it, then do be. It's, you are not crying for attention. You are not um, trying to center a discussion around you because you're special, which is always the scary thing when you talk about mental health. Is someone going to say, well, you're just doing this to get attention, aren't you? Um, but do make sure that it's, if you're comfortable, talk about it. If you're not comfortable, absolutely don't, because that will not help your recovery. But if you're comfortable, talk about it, bring it out into the open. Um, if you know somebody that's going through it, do not be judgmental. See what you can do to be there for that person. And if they say nothing, listen to it. And if they say there is something that you can do, and it's something that you can do, then help them. And just really try and make sure that we bring this into the open. It's, um, it's, I, I have a talk that is around my mental health. And I'm just writing a talk for somebody else who also suffers from anxiety. 
and we're hoping that we get selected at some conferences and again it, it's just to raise the conversation the whole point of that talk isn't to um it's not to glamorize mental health issues or anything like that it's to it's to get the conversation going and you know, so I, i'm not a therapist i cannot give anybody advice but i can say talk about it talking about it's key and i i love what you're doing about potentially doing a presentation on this because again it's it's like the if you see somebody up on a stage actually openly speaking about it normalizing it it makes you feel that again you're not alone if you are going through it and you haven't spoken to anyone about it and I think hearing people's experiences and their journeys on how where they've been in a really low place like your own um, Stacey where you've been through therapy you've found your coping mechanisms and now you're able to do presentations and openly speak about your journey that's so admirable and so many people can just learn from sharing your journeys and there's many different initiatives in the UK. There's the Samaritans, the Mind Charity, but there's also these like virtual groups that you can attend where people come on and they openly share their own stories about their mental health journey, what's helped them, how they've overcome certain aspects. And you can go on to this event um, anonymous and you can have your camera and video off and just sit in and listen. You can turn your microphone on and open up if you would like. It's just this sense of like togetherness I think is really important. Yeah. Now, knowing that you're not alone is, is really such a, an important thing because at the worst time, you, you really do feel completely alone. You, you feel like that there can't be anybody else that, that feels this way. You you feel that there's nobody that can talk to you. You are completely on your own. And like you say, it's like we, we live in the world of the internet. And the internet is a terrible thing and it is an awesome thing. And let's utilize the awesome side more. And I, I love what you were saying about the groups there. It's I have a few... Okay, I wonder if technology is a terrible thing. I, I'm in a few Facebook groups. And discussing this type of thing is normalized and you can even joke with each other because there are some things that you can relate to so well and you just have to smile because yeah been there done that and even if it's not funny at the time some things been there done that I can totally see it but it's also for the for the times when it's not good and it's not funny and just having somebody there that literally understands what you're going through not not that says that oh it's i i understand what you mean and because i'm really sorry if you've not been through it you don't it's um you, you, your understanding is nice and it, it, it is meaningful and it helps but somebody that has been through the depths and has really been to rock bottom i think it, it, it's a level of understanding which is just different and, and having that available to you is so important. So important, surrounding yourself with people that you feel you can speak with. And um, going on to the topic of presenting and call for proposals and all that fun stuff, speaking at many different events, you started that journey back in 2019. And what a journey it's been, Stacey. I've seen many of your talks, the virtual ones, and I just love how you present. Like you really tell a story and I just think it's so engaging. So let's talk a little bit about that, the build up to your first call for proposal, your first presentation. Believe it or not, that, that actually comes from uh, my mental health issues. It was Tekaram in 2018. It was about six months after I'd started to see uh, my therapist. And it was the first year for Tekarama. It is a huge tech conference, the biggest .NET conference in the Netherlands. And I really wanted to go. And I was terrified because my anxiety just, it's, it's a conference. It triggers my anxiety instantly. And I went. I weighed up the, the, the anxiety cost versus what I was going to get out of it. And I went, I got there really early because being late is another trigger for me. Uh, if I'm ever five minutes late for something, I don't go. 
It's like, I'm, I'm five minutes late, ergo, I'm not going. Uh, so I always get there really early. I got there too early this time. I, I gave myself enough time for traffic, and then there was no traffic. So I got there like 90 minutes before the keynote. One of the first attendees, it's empty. And I had, at that point, I didn't have my, um, my safety mechanisms, my coping mechanisms. So I spent 90 minutes slowly winding myself up in my head, getting worse and worse. Got through the keynote in the first two sessions because it's in a cinema, so it's a darkened room. Doesn't matter that there's a thousand people around you, it's a darkened room. You're, there's the speaker and there's you, that's it. Um, but then it got to the first break. And I say it's in a cinema. And cinemas are designed to empty one single cinema at a time. It's all staggered so that you don't get a multiplex of 10 cinemas emptying at one time. In a conference, you have a multiplex of 10 cinemas emptying at one time into not a big corridor, which is crowded with uh, vendor stands, refreshments. Um, and there's a whole cacophony of noise going on around you. And I, it, it just tripped in my head. I, I saw people that I knew at one of the stands. And all of a sudden I had to run. It was, I don't know why. I couldn't explain it today. I certainly couldn't explain it at the time. But I, I couldn't let them see me and know that I was there. I couldn't face them. And I almost ran away from that stall. And I ended up outside of one of the cinemas. I had a total breakdown. I was standing next to the wall. My arms were in front of my head. I don't know what I was protecting myself against, but I was protecting myself against something. And I dropped onto my hunches outside of this cinema and I was just gone. I managed to make it into that cinema. And it was in a break, so it was empty aside from the speaker setting up at the front. So again, I could sit in the dark by myself. I could breathe and try and get back. It worked. I recovered. Um, terrible migraine. I, I always have terrible migraine after anxiety attacks. And more than that, I, I just had the big thing in my head of, you cannot let this be the biggest thing that happens today. It's a two-day conference. And if you go home and this is the biggest thing, you're not going to come back tomorrow. It, it's going to be too hard. It, it's. I was already in tears on the way to the conference. I was already fighting myself not to turn around and go home. And... The next day would just not be possible if this was what I took out of it. What I decided to do was to pay somebody a compliment, which sounds like such a pathetically simple thing to do, but it's something that my anxiety stops me from doing. I, I don't know how to pay somebody a compliment without it coming across as creepy. At least in my head, it comes across as creepy if I give somebody a compliment. But I'd seen somebody walking around in a 50 swing dress, uh, th this awesome blue swing dress, red petticoat, and she looked amazing in it. And that day, I was in jeans and t-shirt. I wear a lot of those types of dresses myself, but that day I was jeans and t-shirt because it's a tech conference and it's not practical to be in that dress. Uh, so I decided, okay, I'm going to give her a compliment. That That's going to be my thing. And if I can do that, that is such an achievement for me. That is going to be my thing for the day. Thankfully, I ran into her when I was washing my hands in the bathroom close to the end of the day. And turns out she wasn't an attendee. She was a speaker. And this is before I was a speaker. And at that point, you know, speakers were like up here. It's that they're these amazing people at conferences. And I'm just somebody who sits in the audience. Uh, now I'm a speaker. That is totally wrong. But at the time, that's totally how I thought. Um, and I just took a couple of big breaths. 
and I just totally rushed out. I've just got to say that's a fantastic dress you're wearing. Again, feeling so creepy standing washing your hands in a bathroom telling somebody that they look awesome in that dress. It's... But she smiled. She said thank you. We had a great talk. Um, and it was really... It, it, it was such a relief. And... She went to do her session. I went to the last session of the day. Um, and I thought that was the end of it. Next day, I turn up in my swing dress because what the hell? If they can do it, I can do it. Just be yourself and be comfortable. So I'm in this black swing dress with our red embroidered roses on the hem, red petticoat, um, the full 50s thing. And this guy ran up behind me and tapped me on my shoulder. Okay. I'm really sorry, but I've just got to say, that session that you did yesterday, it was amazing. I was like, I know exactly who you mean. It wasn't me. Because, you know, it's two women at a tech conference in swing dresses and with red hair, I can see why you'd get confused. It, it's, it's not something you see often. I'm not going to blame him for getting that wrong. Um, but I said, yeah, I'll send her a tweet and I'll pass the compliment on. So uh, I sent the tweet and she answered. I was like, well, I'm in jeans and T-shirt today because I only brought one dress to the conference, but I can't wait to see what your outfit's like. And I thought, oh, isn't that polite? And, uh, but no, over breakfast, she came and found me. Uh, we started to have a really good talk. She, she's the uh, amazing Jessica Engstrom from Sweden. And... We were talking about mental health, about style, about tech. And at one point she just said, you speak with such passion about this. Have you ever considered giving a talk at a conference? Well, no, I, I, I come to conferences. I, I don't speak at conferences. And it turns out that she organizes, helps organize a conference in Sweden, Svetuk. And said, I'll call for speakers open. I can't guarantee that you're gonna get picked, but why don't you apply? It's a conference in a different country with people you don't know. It won't go badly, but even if it does go badly, you're with people who will never, ever see you again. It's the safest way to start speaking. So I said I would, which then is another wonderful trigger because I've now made a, I've not made a promise to anybody, but in my head, I've now made a promise. It's, I've told her I'm going to apply, so I now have to apply. And... I figured out what I was going to talk about, which was my failures, because it's the only thing that I was comfortable talking about, because, hey, I can talk about the things I've done wrong. Not only that, it's my story, so I can't say it wrong. It, it is my story. Um, never expected to get selected, because my abstract was appalling. I still don't like writing abstracts. Um, but I got picked, and I, I actually found out I got picked on holiday with my in-laws we were at a restaurant and my phone went ting and I opened up my phone and I may have screamed just a little bit I, and then of course the, the whole thing starts of OMG I've got to write a talk and um, how uh, I, I managed to get one together uh, my first draft I bored myself I got something together and it's like, okay, empty house. We're going to do a run through and see how it goes. And I think I got about 30 seconds into it. And I just stopped. It's like, yeah, I, I'm boring myself. I can't do this on a stage. And I actually Googled how to start a presentation without boring people. And th there's, a, there's a world of resources out there to help you with this. Um, so anybody in this position, Google it. it. It's a wonderful thing to Google. How not to bore people. And I got some tips, you know, start with a story. Don't start with the introduction. Start with a story. Get people interested in the session and then do your introduction after you've got them hooked on the session. And I rewrote it that way. Um, I flew to Sweden, which was also something because I have a fear of flying. So aside from flying back to see my father when he was dying, I hadn't been on a plane in 13 years. Uh, so flying to a foreign country, not 
anxiety inducing at all getting lost in an airport in Stockholm not finding the hotel I did manage to get lost because I came out of the subway at the wrong station at uh, the wrong um, entrance sorry it's uh, you get out of the subway there's two exits one of them is the exit that everybody knows about and the other one comes out in a side street like half a kilometer away and because you've got no GPS, Google Maps says that you're over by the main entrance because it knows what station you're at. And you're looking around thinking, this does not look anything like that. Found the hotel. Got to the speaker dinner. Eventually, I got lost again. Um, and the speaker community is such a welcoming, open group of people um they really they, they knew that i was a new speaker they knew that i was nervous they they treated me like i wasn't the imposter that i assumed i was and they really got me in, into the group came to the next day time for my talk uh the session before i was in the green room um Going, I went over my presentation like five times in the 45 minutes before giving it. Uh, and again, the speakers in there, they knew it was my first session and they were really talking me up, giving me, giving me useful advice, not just uh, saying, oh, yeah, you'll be fine, but really like helping me prepare. And then it came to the talk and I got into the room 15 minutes early because like I say, I don't get places late. I got everything set up and... Then it was just a waiting game. And because I got there so early, the room's empty. So you're standing in this empty room and it's like, am I going to be the only person? It's like, nobody's interested in what I've got to say anyway. So is this going to be it? Is it just going to be, okay, no one's turned up. We'll just cancel the talk. And then one person came in with about 10 minutes to go and sat um, two rows from the front. And gave me a chance to make a joke. Uh, so, oh, great, at least there's one person here. I'm not giving it to an empty room, uh, which broke the ice and we could have a little chat. Um, five minutes to go was about half full. And at that point, it is. I can do this. There's a couple of speakers in the room. Uh, again, you're like me. Giving me a bit of confidence to get boosted. Jessica was in there and it's not empty but there's not too many people. About three minutes to go and there's two empty seats in the room and I am seriously panicking because why are all these people in here? It's, you know, it's like, do, do I have anything that they're going to want to hear? It's, it, it's no longer just a few people and I can cope with this. It's now something serious. Uh, it was the smallest room in the uh, conference, but that doesn't matter. It's my first talk and there's only two seats over and I'm terrified. And then it came time to start. And I remember what Jessica said to me, which is, when you get the go, do two deep breaths and then start. So I stood at the front of the room. Here. Unmuted the microphone and just... Hello, everybody. I can't believe how many people's in this room today. Oh, and it was just awesome. But from that point on, I was shaking like a leaf from nervous energy, but the actual nerves inside of me disappeared for the most part. And apparently it's, uh, I, I found something I really enjoyed doing, which I was not expecting. I, I was expecting to be useless and to hate it. And it turned out that I got halfway through it and I'm thinking, I have got to do this again. And it, it, it kind of just um, it went from there. That's incredible. Like the journey that you've been on, that confidence that you now have when you're presenting and you're speaking. And I think, again, it ties back into that overthinking, right? It being our worst enemy, us building up a scenario in our mind Nobody's going to like my talk. No one's going to attend or I can't do this. Who do I think I am? The imposter coming in. And um, yeah, when you actually do it and go for it, it's so, so cool to hear how much you enjoy it. And 
I guess what advice can you share then for anyone who's afraid of coming out of their comfort zone to publicly speak? It is scary. It, it is seriously scary. But there is... Outside of how much I enjoy being on stage, um, let's face it, I, I probably just want to be an actor. But I never will be, but I probably just want to be an actor. It is fun being up there. But even if that's not the bit that appeals to you, having the conversations after you've given a talk with people who have been listening, the things that they take from it, um, it is the most energy-giving thing that I've done. Um, I gave a talk on one of my talks on static web apps and I got a tweet later on that day it's like well after watching that talk from Stacey I've given this a try and this is awesome and there is no better feeling but because of the effort and the energy that you've put in you have inspired somebody to try something new and the thing that I've taken away from speaking by doing it is that in the hour that I have on stage, I am not going to be able to teach you how to write or how to use an Azure static web app. What I can do is demonstrate its capabilities. And hopefully what I can do is do that in a way that inspires you to go out and give it a try yourself and to actually start learning. And if you want to get up and go on stage, pick a topic which gives you goosebumps um and i'm saying that right now i have goosebumps on my arms saying that because th this is a bit that i really believe about speaking pick a topic that you are passionate about share that passion and help other people discover the same things and not everybody's gonna like it not everybody is going to um, think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. But if you can inspire one person in that room to go out and try something new, then you have had a material effect on somebody's life and for the positive. And take that away from the speaking that you do. So it, it's... Don't think that you have to be this deep dive expert who knows absolutely everything. Go in there and give your take on something. Give your learnings and your experience and inspire somebody else to figure out how they can use this in their journey. And I think it finally remember, if you are in a room with 100 people, then you have 100 people that have given up their time, possibly their money, in order to come and listen to you. These people do not want you to fail because you don't give up money and time just hoping to see somebody fail. They want to learn something from you and they are rooting for you. They're not, they're not the enemy that is out there waiting to catch you out and waiting to laugh at you, that they are there and they are going to want to help you succeed. And you can go out there and help them succeed too. And if you go with that mindset, yeah, stage fright. I, I, I love being on stage. Like I say, basically, I probably just want to be an actor. I want to throw up the five minutes before I get on stage. After doing this for two, three years, I still want to throw up just before I go on stage. I wanted to throw up before I joined this call today in order to do this podcast with you. Nothing personal, it's just, am I going to make an idiot of myself inside of doing this? And it is a perfectly normal thing. Most speakers have exactly the same and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Um, Yeah, just pick something you're passionate about and enjoy it. Thank you so much for your time today, Stacey, and just for being so open, for not being afraid to be vulnerable and speaking about these topics because it's so, so important. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to today's episode and we hope you're feeling inspired. 
If you are, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, and join us on our mission to create a diverse, inclusive, and equitable universe. This podcast is brought to you by Equal IT, a mission-driven business working to diversify tech teams through refined talent acquisition, complemented by diversity and inclusion consulting. As an Azure Heroes inclusive leader, we aim for teams to cultivate a strong sense of belonging and equity. Find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. We welcome your feedback, questions, and would love to hear from you. Join us next time on Equal Inspired. Thank you.